Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, Pedram, for the uh, invitation. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, a project uh, in my group on uh, chiral magnetic systems and this idea of dynamic symmetry breaking, which is an old idea in, in domain walls. But I'll show you how it shows up in the symmetry of, of some of our uh, results. And I just want to highlight a particular uh, Jeff Brock, who's a graduate student in my group, who is really the leader on this uh, project. And he's online in case we need to bail me out on any questions. So this is a collaboration uh, between uh, UC San Diego, uh, Stefan Majan's group and Institute of John Lamour, and uh, Vincent Sokowski's group at Carnegie Mellon um, University. And so I'm going to, let me, okay. So I'm gonna give a, a very general introduction to chiral domain walls. This might be a bit tutorial for this audience, but uh, there we are. Then I'll talk about uh, the system that I, we're studying, uh, platinum, cobalt, uh, nickel system. It's a very common system, but we see unusual results. I'll talk primarily about the symmetries of the magnetic reversal, kind of shown in this diagram over here. And then I will discuss how dynamic symmetry breaking emerges in these systems, or at least explain some of the results that we're seeing. So, uh, Magnetic wall, I mean, domain walls are uh, sort of inherently chiral. So if you take the simplest wall, a, a block wall here, and you go from up to down, as you wind through the block wall, it's sort of shown down here, uh, projected from the side. So the center spin points out. Going from the left to the right here, you can view this as, let's say, a right-handed uh, domain wall as the magnetization processes. Now you can have uh, equivalently a left-handed uh, block a domain wall where the spins uh, process in the opposite direction. And these walls are often referred to as achiral uh, because they are energetically equivalent, uh, but they do have uh, an inherent chirality uh, to them. So when you start to uh, make structures where you add these domain walls together, the topology of the magnetic domain start to appear. So if you take, uh, two uh, domain walls, a right-handed domain wall and a left-handed domain wall, and put them together. Uh, and, you, and you follow the angle of the spin as you move across from left to right across the structure. You can, if you define this at zero, you see it, it goes 180 degrees. And then because it's the opposite chirality, it winds back, uh, back down to zero. So this would have a, a winding number or a topological charge of a zero. Uh, because you don't get any net phase as you transverse across this object. And so this is uh, topologically equivalent uh, to the uniform state. And so when you apply a field uh, to this, uh, where these two domain walls will start to shrink into each other, uh, because this is topologically equivalent to the uniform state, uh, these two domain walls can easily merge and it's quite easy to annihilate these two walls. And it's can seen here that these two center spins are in the same direction so they can merge together. So now if you uh, add the same structure but with two right-handed domain walls or two walls that have the same uh, chirality, what you see is as you move across, you now pick up a phase of uh, 360 degrees as you go across this and so this can have a winding number uh, one. And so now this, or a topological charge of one. And so now this is uh, topologically distinct from the uniform state. And so if you apply a magnetic field to this and you try to merge these together, it can't continuously deform into the uniform state. It's what's known as topologically stabilized or topologically protected, it takes much higher fields. And I'll just point out that these kind of, this is known as a 360 degree domain wall. Uh, this was very common or this was considered a, a problem in the old days uh, because they were much harder to get out of devices with an applied field. But like with many things uh, now, what once was a bug is now a feature. And so now we're uh, actually featuring these kind of uh, topological structures in all kinds of different ways as seen in a number of the talks uh, so far. And what allows this to come out is the control of the chirality. So we have a fixed chirality in the system. So topological uh, distinct states will start to emerge. And so we have a combination of the Heisenberg exchange that wants it to be parallel or anti-parallel spins 
And then we can introduce a Dalashinsky Marie interaction or DMI that was been discussed uh, earlier. It goes as S1 cross S2. Uh, this dates back to the early late 50s, early 60s. And it was, used, was originally described in terms of non centrosymmetric materials, like for example, here, manganese silicon, which is a B20 uh, crystal structure. And so if you see, you take the structure, this red atom and this red atom, and you flip the structure over, you will get a distinct state. So this structure is non centrosymmetric. So you have uh, this kind of energy term here. Then in the 80s, early 80s, uh, Ferret and Peter Livy showed that this would also, should also appear in spin glass uh, structures. And more importantly, for the structures that have been discussed primarily uh, in this session and recently, is that uh, symmetry breaking at an interface, particularly if you put a magnetic film next to a large spin orbit coupled structure, uh, that you get, uh, and if this interface and the top interface are distinct, you get a structurally non centrosymmetric uh, film and you will get a DMI. So the DMI will tend to want the structures to be at 90 degrees. Uh, uh, Heisenberg exchange wants them to be parallel. And so the combination of these two will give some kind of uh, winding of the structure uh, similar to a domain wall. And what makes this important is the handedness is set by uh, D. And so left and right handed domain walls now will no longer be energetically uh, equivalent and one uh, domain wall handedness will be preferred in the system. And then if you look at the domain wall energy when you add, add DMI, so DMI wants a, a spin spiral, that's the structure you see in a domain wall. Uh, DMI, uh, this is sort of an approximation, lowers the energy of the domain wall. So in structure, in magnetic films with DMI, usually the domains or domain structures are much smaller. It's much easier to bring domains in. And in fact, if the DMI is large enough, you can, you can get this effect where the domain wall energy becomes negative. And so the system will collapse into a state with domain walls, which are often refers to a, like a helix state in the system where you have a continuous winding of 360 degree walls. Now the, the system, the topological state that people are most interested in now, I would say, or is getting most of the work, although new topological structures are, are starting to appear, are skirmions. And uh, I will just point out that there's generally two kinds of skirmions. If you have a uh, bulk-like uh, DMI, uh, you get uh, block type walls. And so you get a topological uh, state here where you get block walls that separate the magnetization being up outside and down in the middle. And for the interfacial DMI uh, systems that are studied in thin films, uh, you tend to get chiral nail walls. So you get uh, a, a skirmion structure like this where the spin is down in the middle out and you get a, a chiral nail wall in between. Uh, both of these have a topological charge or winding number of one. If you want uh, to read uh, some review articles, particularly on this latter one here, I've just shown some examples here of recent uh, review articles that go through this. And there's many, many systems that's been studied for this. So I'm gonna be focusing on interfacial DMI and chiral uh, nail walls. And so the system uh, we've been uh, studying is platinum, cobalt, nickel, platinum. It's kind of a very uh, simple and common type of structure that is studied in thin films. Uh, the platinum cobalt interface, the cobalt nickel interface and the nickel platinum interface all give you perpendicular anisotropy. Uh, so these have reasonably high PMA. Uh, the platinum cobalt interface uh, is well studied and gives you a uh, DMI, interfacial DMI. And then the, plat the nickel platinum interface also gives a DMI, but it has the opposite sign. So the expectation for a structure like this is that the platinum cobalt interface and the nickel platinum interface, the DMI values have the opposite sign will be added because the top structure is inverted. And so these kind of uh, cobalt nickel type structures have been studied in a number of systems uh, shown down here. So I'm not gonna talk much about skirmions, but I will just say that we see skirmions in this uh, system. Uh, this is for platinum, cobalt, nickel, uh, 20 repeats. 
And uh, when we image these, and this is done with transmission X-ray microscopy imaging at LBNL, and Peter Fisher in the next talk will probably give you a lot of detail on the capabilities there of imaging these kind of structures. But what we find is that if we just apply a field, we see striped domains in the system, we're up and down domains here that change with field, uh, but we don't see the system go into skirmions. However, as was seen by the ferret group and the beach group, if we apply a large a current pulse, which acts as a heat pulse, you can uh, convert the strike phase into the skirmion phase, and then these skirmions are stable in zero field and have a size of about 100 to 150 uh, nanometers. So if you wanna read more about that, that is in this paper here. But what I wanted to talk about is a little bit surprising is the impact of this chirality on the magnetic reversal of these systems. So I'm gonna start first with very, very thin uh, films which uh, grow by bubble domains. So let's take a very simple case. And this is, a, this is used by a lot of people that you have an up domain here, uh, down domain outside, and you apply an out of plane field that will want to grow this domain here. And so these two domain walls will grow out in response to the magnetic field. So now if you combine this with an in-plane magnetic field, this breaks the symmetry of the problem. And so it will couple uh, for a nail wall, it will couple anti-parallel to this side, it'll couple parallel to this side. So the left right side becomes energetically inequivalent. So if you look at a, oops, a bubble, uh, domain growth, and this is from the literature shown here, that if you have no in-plane field and you just see the bubble domains grow, they just expand out. And if you put an in-plane field in, you can see left versus right. Now there's an asymmetry in the growth and you see an asymmetry in the system growing out. And this is a, usually often used as a signature of chiral neal walls in the system where the in-plane field breaks uh, the symmetry. So we see this uh, for uh, cobalt, uh, nickel, platinum, wherein we have either one unit cell of this or two unit cells. This is an example of a domain growing here. Uh, we've nucleated a domain and then uh, we have an in-plane field and we pulse the out-of-plane field and the domain grows and you can see it grows more to the right than to the left. And if you do this uh, for many, many different in-plane fields, you can extract out a DMI value. So we get a DMI value here uh, that is not uh, unexpected for a material system like this. And in fact, uh, in collaborations with Carnegie Mellon, we image that we have Neal walls in the system. And given the nature of the DMI, we'd expect the Neal wall to be kind of like shown here, going around the system like this. Okay, now what was surprising or a little bit surprising is that if we now go from two repeats of cobalt nickel platinum, we go to three, what we see is now the reversal uh, starts to reverse like stripe domains, like I showed initially for those much thicker films. Now, this is a signature of, D of DMI uh, because um, in thin films this thin, there's not an expectation for striped domains to form in this energetically, but because DMI very much lowers the, the cost of adding domain walls into a system, you see even for these very, very thin films, you see the reversal start to appear uh, by uh, striped domains. And this is again, consistent with the presence of interface DMI. And so what we wanted to do is now say, what is the effect of an in-plane symmetry breaking field on the reversal of these um, stripe or dendritic stripe domains. And so uh, we started looking at this. And so these are MOC images. Uh, the domain wall widths here are about three microns, so we can image them magneto-optically. And so now here's the reversal, the stripe domain, sorry, the stripe domain. Okay, my computer doesn't all right, well, it doesn't want to go back from the stripe phase, but now we apply an in-plane field that's pointing in this direction, of 0.4 kiloersteds, and you see a couple things that start to appear. One, once the domains nucleate, uh, they grow in one direction. So you can see all of these domains, once they nucleate, there's only growth in one direction. 
And somewhat surprisingly is the growth direction is nearly down, but slightly to the left. So even though we're expecting a left right symmetry breaking in the system, uh, the domains are growing uh, primarily down in the system, per uh, nearly perpendicular to the in-plane field. So now if we increase the in-plane field, you see that the domain growth starts to grow in a different direction. So now we see domains growing in this direction. And if we increase the field even more in plane field and measure the growth of the domains, we see they revert about 180 degrees and start growing in the opposite direction. And now we get a growth direction like this. And so this growth, this change in the growth direction with the magnitude of the in, in plane field, uh, you can change the in plane field and the domains will change growth. Uh, this is not particularly useful, but it just shows the effect. Uh, this is a wire we patterned. So for one in-plane field, the domains grow this way. You change the in-plane field and you see they start growing the other way. You can do it here. You can get them to bend around the corner. This is just the magnitude of the in-plane field. So what this says is it's not related to the nucleation process. This direction changes on fly. So it has to do with the spin structure at the growth front of these domains as they move uh, through the system. So we can start to look at these uh, symmetries in the system. And what we find is that uh, if we put an out-of-plane domain, we put an in-plane field this way or this way, we get up, uh, we get growth like this, like this, and then it switches. If we switch the in-plane field direction, we see everything switches in the opposite direction. So in terms of switching the in-plane field, the symmetries are what we would expect, but it's not what we'd expect from interfacial DMI. Because if you take an interfacial DMI system like this with no field, you would expect all the spins if you go around a bubble like this to point inwards, and the system should be symmetric top to bottom and left uh, to right. When you apply an in-plane field, uh, you break the symmetry left to right, but you still have a symmetry top to bottom that you would expect. And so what you would expect is the top, the, whatever is happening up here is the same energetically equivalent to here. And so there's no reason to expect it would grow up versus down in this kind of structure. But if you look at this kind of spin here, this is unstable in the field. And so you might expect that this spin might flop in one direction or flop in the other direction. And if this spin at the end does, then you get a spin structure that kind of winds around like this. And so this looks like now it has a block character to it. But the, the, in interfacial DMI, there's the same equivalent block chirality in the other direction. These two are energetically equivalent. But if we can uh, throw away one of these windings and say the system winds in this way, then now top versus bottom is an equivalent and this symmetry will start to appear out of the system. So now uh, we thought, there, oh, there, we know how to get block-like uh, chirality, that's bulk-like DMI. And so for a long time, I had my poor student, Jeff, grow all kinds of systems. I have it in the follow-up if, <laughs> if you wanna see them, trying to find this bulk-like DMI, which we uh, never, uh, found. And then at some point, Jeff pointed out to me uh, that if we look at these symmetries now where we switch the out of plane field, and again, we see the symmetry with the in plane field switching. But what you find is for the same in plane field, but the opposite out of plane field, you find that the directions don't switch. The left right direction switch, oh. like respect from interfacial DMI but the up-down direction is the same. So this can't be related to interfacial DMI and the up-down symmetry cannot be a structural symmetry breaking the system because this would infer when we change the direction of the magnetization in the system, we're changing the sign of the DMI bulk like DMI. And so that's why we came to the notion of dynamic symmetry breaking and so as a domain wall, and we've heard about this earlier, a domain wall moves in a system and is, you get uh, torques acting on uh, this, uh, these spins in the domain wall as they're moving through the system. And this uh, 
processional torque will give rise to a handedness to the system. And this goes back all the way back to Walker. And it's the origin of Walker breakdown when these torques become too high and the, and the domain wall stops. Uh, but Sanchez Tejeria showed a few years back that a domain, that a nail wall moving uh, in field will twist away from the nail condition and pick up a block like character. And what's important about that is that if you look at the torques coming from the Z component of the field, acting on the spins with the magnetization coming up or the magnetization coming down, the, it has the same chirality of the nail component, but what you find is that they, the, the contribution of this torque goes in the same direction, so has an effectively an opposite sign in terms of a bulk uh, chirality. And so this torque gives a block like twisting to a moving domain, and it gives the same rotation direction for both polarities. And so this is generally not considered when we, people look at these circular domains. So we worked with the Solkowski's group uh, at CMU, uh, where they did an extension of their model here that was published in, in PRL on, um, and what we, they did is, if you wanna go to this, you can get all the details of this model. But we took the spin structure around a circle like this uh, with, and then we calculated the static um, spin configuration. And that's shown in the gold film here. And then they added the dynamic uh, twisting of it, of the system moving, and that's shown here. And then uh, within their model, um, they, they calculated what uh, would be the expected creep velocity of a domain wall with this kind of uh, domain configuration as you move around it. So you calculate the velocity you expect for a domain wall to grow, and that's plotted here. And so what you see is this defect point here, you get a very sharp point here where you get this would be the expected fastest growth. And that's actually what we see in our domain wall growth here. Let me make sure I'm still on time. How much time do I have? Am I okay? Uh, you are okay, maybe three or four minutes. Okay, I will bring it. So then what happens is you change the in-plane field and you can see now we, they predicts a growth direction in this direction, which we see, and then you increase the field again and you see a growth direction in this direction that goes in this direction here. And so we can uh, start to see this. And the reason we think this becomes so, uh, these effects become so obvious when we go into the stripe phase is that when you're having reversal by narrow stripe domains, the front, uh, your, uh, the front of the domain wall that's propagating through the film can selectively pick out a very narrow region of energy space going around. So it very, it very efficiently picks out this point in the energy curves as you move around the domain walls. And this would be the direction that would be preferred uh, to grow. And so uh, if you take that model, what we find is that uh, we can uh, capture all of these symmetries. Uh, the left-right symmetries uh, come from the interfacial DMI in the system, and the up-down symmetries uh, come from the dynamic twisting of the domain wall uh, during uh, motion. If you sort of extend this and you make the uh, model, you quantitatively compare, so this is uh, showing some of the data here. So this is the direction we see as a function of in-plane field uh, experimentally, and they were, where it starts to go down and then switches 180 degrees. And this is the predictions of the model, uh, which are quite close and, and, and capture all the features that we show here. Uh, so I'll just uh, conclude with that. I have a few backup slides if people are interested. Uh, we see this unusual directional growth uh, in the domains of these chiral, platinum, cobalt, nickel structures. Uh, the directions of the growth shown here and down here reflect both the structural uh, asymmetries in this structure through the interfacial DMI. But very importantly, you have to consider the dynamic symmetry breaking in the system uh, to understand the growth of these domain walls in here and steady tight dynamics plus this dispersive stiffness offers a good fit uh, to what we are uh, imaging. So I'll, I'll end with that and thank you very much.